16th of February, 1951, Richter claimed he had successfully demonstrated fusion. He reran the experiments for members of uh, one of the Argentina scientific groups, yeah. later claiming that they had witnessed the world's first thermonuclear reaction. So he claimed on their behalf, that's what they saw. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's totally what they saw. Can we talk to them? No, they're busy. Now, it's worth noting, there was a technician at the site who said, look, I'm not sure because one of the graphs was tilted. And, oh. and so so the line that you show going up, that's because the plate was tilted. So, so it might not have been, it might, <laughs> be, it might have been going, um, I'm going to say down. Rector refused to rerun the experiment. He said, no, we've got it, of we've course. got it, this is done, we're not, we're not, we're not doing it anymore. Why mess with perfection? A week later, he said, pull down the reactor um, so that we can build a new one in its place. And, and that's what you do. That worked really well, <laughs> trash it. Straight away, it worked I never once, want to show this fuck again. it off. <laughs> Just makes sense, that's the science. The 23rd of March uh, 1989 was a bit of a red letter day for science communication. You see, the management at the University of Utah, uh, I think they got a bit spooked. I think they got a little bit panicked. I think they were sitting on what they thought was the gold mine of gold mines, the discovery of the century. Nobel Prizes let out the wazoo for everyone who discovered. It would uh, change the future of humanity. That's good. In, like in a good way? In a good way. In a, in, in, you know, uh, and literally, this, this, if it was true, would have been absolutely Not a, like a, a neutron bomb where, well, there's no more humans, but everything else is good. <laughs> no, not like that. Not, not, not like that at all. No, yeah. um, all positive. And, you know, they thought there would be mega stacks of bucks involved here too. Mm. And so it made them uh, make some decisions that were a little bit uh, outside of the normal process. And so well, uh, things got a little bit unorthodox. Did they? The simple story is that Stanley Pons, who is the professor and chair of uh, the Department of Chemistry there at the University of Utah. I, I, I was worried that name might come up. Yeah, but you, you wait, you wait. And his, uh, his mate, uh, Martin Fleischmann, they've been working for a year or so on the idea that, insert an element here, palladium. Mm. Oh, yeah. Use that as a cathode in a simple heavy water electrolysis cell. Oh, a simple one. Yeah, okay. It, all Fuck up, all, the complex okay. ones. Yeah. It's, it's not a terribly complicated thing. So you've got a bucket. Yep. Um, and it's got heavy water in it rather than regular water. Deuterium. Nice. And then you chuck some wires in there, um, like a, a normal battery. One's the positive, one's the negative. Oh, you don't literally just chuck some wires in. Yeah, no, no. no. You okay. connect, them, connect them up to a battery yep. or an electric current, and you just make sure that with the cathode, you make it out of palladium. Yes. And they reckon that can be a pathway to room temperature nuclear fusion. So that's, you know, uh, nuclear fusion, harnessing the power of the sun, yeah. uh, like nuclear fission, but heaps cheaper because the stuff that you use for it is basically buckets and, uh, well, in their theory, and water. So, Well, deuterium. I mean, well, I don't have much of that lying around, do you? Oh, you can get it from water. You can get it from seawater. They had this idea that, um, hey, we might have nuclear fusion, something that you could run in like a desktop apparatus, and, and, and the ingredients – are just cheap and free. And so, you know, if you're a, if you're How hard could it be? Any country, any anywhere in the world, cheap, limitless energy. Sounds awesome. But so, then big oil came in and took it away. Is that what you reckon? That's exactly what it is. <laughs> anyway, so Pons and Fleischmann, um, they'd been conducting these electrolysis experiments in in their bucket. I'm just calling it a bucket, an insulated vessel, um, mm. to measure the the ex, the heat that is produced. Yeah. Now they they'd run the current through it, and um, it, they're running it for multiple weeks, sort of thing, and um, and they're measuring the temperature. And so most of the time, the temperature is not changing; it's okay. sitting there at thirty degrees. Suddenly, their little bucket gets hot. Mm. Not super hot, mm. but hot. It gets to fifty degrees enough that you can go from okay, this is a, a lukewarm bath to a warm bath. And they're like, "But hang on, we haven't done anything different. We haven't changed the um, the electricity going in. We haven't changed the elements going in here. All this could possibly be maybe, maybe they said maybe magic nuclear fusion. Could it be? I have to say, adorable. We got a bucket of water. It's sitting in a room. Okay, sorry, was it insulated vessel? Yeah. Uh, we put in some wires. It's 30. Now it's 50. It must be just like the heart of the sun. <laughs> That's my first conclusion. <laughs> Looks a lot like the sun. Obviously, obviously. <laughs> Maybe they weren't right. It's the things that happen next that, are, that are, you know, that, that turn this into an event worth talking about. So the first thing that happened was sensible. So Pons and Fleischmann, they're applying for money to the U.S. Department of Energy. They said, hey, we'd like to study this. Sounds sensible. And U.S. Department of Energy said, okay, yeah, we've got to get you peer reviewed first. So, hey, ho, hey, ho, hey. so they sent okay. a, another another guy who was studying fusion, um, also in Utah, 
uh, Steve Jones from Brigham Young University. So he's doing some work as well. And he said, all right, cool, I'll do the peer review. Now, he he peer reviewed Pons and Fleischmann's work. And I'm, I don't actually have what, what he said at this point. What? But at the bare minimum, he said, okay, look, this is interesting. Like whether sure. whether this is the holy grail of we're making we're making nuclear fusion on our desk, or it's a it's an interesting scientific thing that's worth studying. The water got warmer. That's or, interesting. Or, or at least that's worth following up. Yeah, you know? that's fair. Um, and and he said to them, well, maybe we're we're all based in Utah. Um, maybe we should work together on this. So they started sharing information um, in early 1989 and they met at Jones's lab in late February. And, and this is where I think they started to get excited. Right. Or at least Pons and Fleischmann started to get excited because the next time they agreed to meet, which is yeah. early March, just a couple of weeks later, yeah. they brought their university presidents in. Like so, why they, fuck around? Yeah, they're, they're going yeah, straight, straight to the top. top. You've, yep, you've got to yep. be here because this, this is the media. And, and we like, want Bill Gates and another rich guy from the time. And, look, and the Queen. Look, you can imagine these university presidents like, oh, damn, this, this could be worth- This could be good for us. Tens of dollars. Uh, like, could, yeah, maybe even a hundred. <laughs> this could be. I think, I think at this point, Pons and Fleischmann thought they'd got the discovery of the century, or potentially. Yeah. Jones was like, yeah, nah, this, yeah. this could just be some interesting bit of physics. Like, this is, this is publishable, could be interesting, but he's not yeah. thinking, thinking fair, like that. Fair, fair. So the problem is that, um, that because Jones thought it was- um, an interesting quirk. Mm. He wasn't too troubled talking about it, and uh, ah. he submitted a paper for a, for a conference that was coming up in May. And it's not quite what peer reviewers are supposed to do. Well, he's he's putting his abstract out there for peer review. Uh, but he was the reviewer. He was the initial reviewer. But he, after peer review, he said, "Let's join up." Like he, he was, he was ah. such a good review. He said, "Let's let's join like, up." Yeah, I'm gonna let me do you guys a favor. <laughs> let me on your bandwagon. And right? Pons and Fleischman are like, "Oh shit." We weren't quite ready for that. We weren't quite ready to have some of these ideas talked about um, uh, a little bit more public. Uh, I think I think they wanted to test it. They wanted to do good science. They wanted to work it out. Not to mention, get um, safe from the oil companies. Yeah, but they were worried. If it actually was and Jones got out there and scooped them, then they're like, oh, shit, shit, shit. There goes my infinity dollars. So they agreed to uh, submit a joint article. Um, that they would they would submit the joint article on the 24th of March. Um, in, weirdly, that they would all go to the airport at the same time to send it by FedEx to to Nature or something like that. Uh, it's it's kind of like it's very something going on here. Yeah, I, I don't know. But um, the University of Utah, where Pons and Fleischmann were, um, eh, they were a little bit worried about this. Hmm. They were like, no, no, we've got to we've got to get out in front of this. And so on the 23rd of March. They called a press conference. They right. said, "Look, rather than uh, rather than waiting for peer review, let's declare to the world that uh, we've got cold fusion." Good idea. <laughs> Good idea. Now that became one of the biggest stories in science of the year. It was, it was a huge moment where people sitting at a desk with you know the variety of little <sighs> apparatus there said, "We can probably." Do fusion with high school chemistry materials mm. and ingredients that are worth nothing. And as I said before, this would have been scooped. a huge discovery. We don't want to get scooped. So what we'll do is we'll just say we've done it in front of mm, <laughs> that's, everyone. That's it, really. We don't want to get scooped. So so let's just say let's we've done. Say it. we've done. <laughs> we say we've done it first. Piss off. <laughs> and I love you can blame the university and say, oh, university management one. It's a little bit that if you don't believe it, then you go, no, this is not legit yet. We, or we've got to do more work anyway. I, uh, <laughs> so careful about getting talked into uh, you know, going to a press release a little bit earlier. There, are, there aren't many be. like really kind of naughty, nasty rules in science slash academia slash publishing, but that's most of them. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Don't, don't steal credit and don't get out before you can credibly say more than one human being's checked this. So spoiler here, or not even because, you know, you're, you're here in a second – it didn't work. Didn't like, it? Like, I don't know quite what happened, but um, basically pretty quickly the rest of the world or the American um, Physics Congress said, this is garbage. Ah, uh, balls. Like this is yeah. this. You know, there's stories of like a month, month and a half later, the American Physical Society held a session on it. Um, you know, oh, okay. that's at their conference, so they're holding a, a d discussion about it. Mm. At the end of the session, eight of the nine leading speakers stated that they considered the initial Fleischmann and Pons claim dead. Just one person abstained. Uh, Stephen Coonan of Caltech uh, stood up and called the Utah Science Report the incompetence and delusion of Pons and Fleischmann, which was met with a standing ovation. So pretty much it's dead. Uh, now, that, that, that's pretty um, clear. 
it did it did keep going. Uh, yeah. They kept doing research on it for the next couple of years. There were, there were other conferences, so it had something. Sure, they had to keep looking. But, yeah. but, but the thing that interests me is this is not the first scandal in nuclear fusion work. And it's not the first time that people have got out in front of a press conference and said, hey, world, we've got some nuclear fusion. For that, Fuck. for that, we need to go to a secret laboratory in a forest on an island <laughs> in a lake high up in the mountains and to a weirdly similar press conference, this time also on the 24th of March. I think the other one was 23rd of March. Close enough. 24th of March, 1951 when a dictator announced to the world that the scientists in his country had successfully liberated the energy of nuclear fusion and soon energy would be so cheap it would be sold in half-litre bottles like milk. Welcome to The Wholesome Show. The podcast that fuses the whole of science. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. And me, uh, rambling Rod Lamberts. Not because of language. Rambling Rod. Right. I've been rambling. Four weeks in an Italian summer and I'm still yellow. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair. Your skin type is not tan. We are not what you call olive. <laughs> We're more what you call white. Lobster. Kind of pink. Juan Domingo Perón. He's like the standard guy yeah. of, of South American dictator. Yeah. Like if you if you put them all in and you shuffle them around yeah. and you do like a machine learning thing, up pops um, one perom. Hola, I'm in charge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kill people who don't like you me. You know, he's an army careerist. He did all of course. That. He worked his way to the top by being in the right part of coups at the right sort of time. You know, there's, there's quite there's a few there's coups tradition. going yeah, on. You've got a yeah. tradition. Uh, he's being willing, as, as uh, fascist dictators must, to be brutal at the right time. Um, and not, also not, not brutal, strong. Well, strong yeah. and doing super popular stuff with celebrities and things like that. He was president of Argentina uh, after World War II from yep. 1946 to his overthrow in 1955. Then he came back for another stint yeah. uh, in the 70s. Quickly, we're not we're not looking at the 70s stint. Boring, um, boring stint. You know, during his first presidential term, he was supported by, as I said, his his popular second wife, Eva Duarte. Duarte. Evita, um, they they did a whole bunch of stuff stuff that was popular with the working class. Uh, invested heavily in public works, expanded social welfare, forced employers to improve working conditions. What a monster! I, you know, you know, what a monster! I, I just remember that, that uh, even evil people can do nice things. Um, On the way up, yeah. Trade trade unions grew rapidly with his support, and mm. w- women's suffrage was granted with uh, Eva's influence. Of course, the whole idea of voting in a dictatorship was like, sure, you can, you can all equally Go not on. vote. Yeah, no, yeah, vote, vote <laughs> twice, men, whatever. Fuck it, <laughs> vote as often as you want for me. <laughs> Great. I'm more so, than yeah, not quite, not yeah. quite full actual suffrage. No. Um, on the other hand, of course, dissidents were fired, exiled, arrested, tortured. Mm. Uh, the press was super controlled. So you know. It's and it's been carefully monitored. And the other thing, of course, is that Perron had uh, a huge penchant of importing Nazi war criminals. For his collection? Uh, yes, he had quite a good collection. I don't of, have a Himmler yet. Of, of all of the collections of Nazi war criminals, I think uh, Perron had, had the best. It inspired a lot of very interesting movies, though, so that's cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, famous ones. So Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the organisers of the um, of the Holocaust, uh, Joseph uh, Mengele, um, who was, you know, evil concentration camp guy. Don't need to go into these. Uh, leader of Croatian nationalist movements, so basically, basically Nazis there. Yeah. They, they imported heaps and heaps of Nazis. Why did Perron import these Nazi yeah. walkers? You have one bit, it seems like he was actually, he, like he thought this was humanitarian. Like he, the, on, on his deathbed sort of thing, he said, in Nuremberg at the time, something was taking place that I personally considered a disgrace and an unfortunate lesson for the future of humanity. Okay. I became certain that the Argentine people also considered Nuremberg process a disgrace, unworthy of the victors who behaved as if they hadn't been victorious. Now we realize that they deserve to lose the war. He's arguing that the, the whole Nuremberg uh, war criminal process was, was- That was the true crime of the war? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, but different perspectives. He did think he was protecting people that were- just doing their jobs. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was one side. But, of course, the other side is that, um, uh-huh. you know, having a bunch of people who are willing to do things and use their brains for things. And may have certain networks and resources at their disposal. Could be useful. Yeah. So, you know, the Americans have Operation Paperclip um, where they brought a whole bunch of – That's fucking Microsoft Office, wasn't it? 
that's that's where yeah that's, that's where, where it came, came from. from. No, but that's where they brought a bunch of um, Nazi rocket scientists in particular. I see you're trying um, to build a thermonuclear device. Would you like a hand with that? They brought heaps yeah. over there. Uh, the Soviets yeah. had Operation Osovakiam. Viacom. They did it in a different way, though, where they went in one night and grabbed them all and, and took them back to the Soviet Union. Very Soviet. Very <laughs> Soviet way of doing efficient. business. Um, but the, there was clearly programs around the world to grab German scientists. Mm. And so what um, Peron was thinking here is, as well as the humanitarian thing, is like, okay, these can be useful for national development. Yes. You know, we can do some do some good stuff with them. We build some bomb dams and some bomb communication devices and some bomb hospitals. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least you're saying bomb. I mean, there's the other things that they were expert in that they didn't do. So, bread making. Well, there's the, there's, the, there's the torture and the yeah, but concentration you can, you campy can stuff. Quickly move that and put it to agrarian purposes. <laughs> if you want to grow wheat, to... what you need to grow wheat is a good torture. Torture the wheat. Yeah, like yeah, that's what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know, they, they, there's a couple that I'll just mention. Um, Emil uh, Dilatin, who moved to Argentina to work on the. Um, Pulky jet fighter. He was a French collaborationist. Uh, there was the Luftwaffe airplane designer Kurt Tank, and then there was Ronald Tank designs planes. I know, right? I Come know. on. And then Ronald Richter. Ronald Richter was born in Falconeau and der Eger in Bohemia. Actual it, Bohemian. Yes, an actual Bohemian. Not some bloody wannabe. Yeah, who yeah. eats weird things and wears a hat. He went to the German University of Prague, where he graduated in 1935. Uh -huh. uh, then I think he went on to do uh, doctoral studies, but it's weird. Um, I can't find a lot of the information here. Some people say he failed his doctoral thesis. Yeah. Some people say he changed to a different topic. Other people say, mm, we're not actually sure, but we know that the university was bombed and so all the records are gone. So That's what you do. Mm, I just yeah. got a professorship in Ukraine. Yeah, exactly. We do know he was working on – Things that are not far from the sort of ideas of nuclear fusion. So right. ele electric arc furnaces, um, looking oh, yeah. to develop accurate methods for measurement and control of temperatures. So this is, you know, in, in a lab, you know, you'd use them to, to heat metals up or heat materials up to get them to super, super heated yeah. um, sort of temperatures. Cool. You, you also use that in industrial processes. I do. He discovered that the injection of heavy hydrogen, deuterium, um, would cause a nuclear reaction, which he could measure and gauge with Geiger counters. So he's he's doing some stuff in this. Shouldn't world. he be using the Richter scale? He probably should, but you know he missed out on well, that. It doesn't count for yeah, his. It's the wrong one, but yeah, yeah. It's named after me. This yeah. measurement is six. <laughs> Completely irrelevant. It's got nothing to do with earthquakes, mate. Yeah, but it's my name. Um, during World War Two, it's weird. I can't find a lot of what he did. Yeah. Um, look, theoretically, anyone working in uh, nuclear f nuclear type stuff in Germany during the war is super classified, of course. Really? Um, so there is work out there on Hitler's Hitler's nuclear bomb, stuff like that. Um, Went well. But he did work with um, Max Steenbach and Professor Manfred von Arden, um, who who we know did work on particle accelerators, and that, some of those people went on to work on the Soviet um, bomb afterwards. So so on there's clearly fellas. expertise, okay. and so he's clearly working there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that there is some evidence that he wrote a letter to Central Command in Germany, um, suggesting a type of a type of thing that could be done in a fusion reactor or or something like that. You know, um, I've got no idea. Or, no, he said we could use um, shock waves inside uh, shock waves with high velocity particles shot into highly compressed plasma um, would would get you some fusion. I don't know. Don't worry about. Don't worry about the details there. But he's 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 suggesting stuff in the fusion sort of world, and so it suggests he probably was actually working. The cowboy days of this period would have been hilarious. It's like, okay, what's a oh. big hot bang thing, and another weird bang thing of something very hard. Well, didn't you, let's throw them together and see what happens. Didn't you tell the story of the Demon Core a while ago? I did. You know, you know where they're, they're keeping stuff apart with screwdrivers and things yeah, like that. Yeah. That, uh, that don't have these go. things touch, otherwise there'll be a, a literal nuclear de detonation. Yeah. Look, and, and all right, I'll put my rubber gloves on then. In in the interesting thing here is because. Um, People working on fusion, they're typically working with with much lighter elements. So there's not really mm. any radiation going on. And the the dangers are very different to working in fission where, you know, it's uranium, heavy yeah. and and literally you can have scenarios where, you know, the the experiments in Los Alamos and other places where things would actually explode in semi-nuclear ex, uh, explosions. Whereas in the fu in the fusion world, you have to generate a lot of energy and heat a to lot get of things. Hot to, stuff. But it the stuff itself is not super dangerous. So we're, we're talking- No, boiling water can be very dangerous. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, that's true. I mean, come on. And but buckets, people choke on them all the time. Look, yes. You get yes. strangled on wires. I mean, it's a nightmare. Anyway, his his proposal to the central command in, in Nazi Germany didn't get through. Ah. 
But anyway, when the when the war ended, it seems like Richter drifted around a little bit. He he wasn't rounded up by the Soviets um, like uh, like his boss yeah. um, von Arden, um, or by the Americans. Uh, oh. We know that he spent six months working for uh, working on explosives and a few commercial contracts, but in, it's, me- in Mexico or something. Uh, no, I think it could have been between London and uh, London and Germany somewhere. At some point, he bumped into the Luftwaffe engineer and test pilot Kurt Tank. As I said before, the tank guy in charge Wait, of the planes. Aren't you Kurt Tank? <laughs> Let me buy you a beer. Yeah. Now, Tank was part of a group that was saying, hey, you know, we could get to Argentina. Um, he was talking to a bunch of other German scientists at the time. Yeah, okay. And, and, and look, not a, I, I don't necessarily know. A tank doesn't seem to have been a war criminal. I don't think Richter necessarily was. Um, they were scientists involved in the German war machine. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot that weren't in, involved in the concentration camp and the, and the yep. Holocaust. They were, you know, building planes and things like that. I'm sure it's entirely possible many of them didn't know what was actually going on. But they did certainly travel under um, false passports and under assumed names just to keep it quiet because people might be looking for them. So you seem I don't know. a little war criminal. It, it seems it seems like if if you're not a war criminal, then then you might travel under your own name. If you are, then you travel under uh, a pseudonym. No, but I, I can imagine a world where they're like, look, you seem relatively senior and. How could you not know? It's like, believe me, it was possible. Look, yeah, I don't know. Richter travelled under the name of Dr. Pedro Mathis. Oh, yeah, Always go with Pedro. So on the 16th of August, 1948, yep. uh, travelling, as I said, under the name of Pedro Mathis, Richter ends up in uh, Argentina. Eight days later, he had a meeting with Juan Perón, at which he pitched to Perón mm. the idea of a nuclear fusion device that would provide unlimited power, making Argentina a world scientific leader and purely civilian intent, which if, if, if you're a dictator and someone's like, I'm going to make a device for you that provides unlimited power. You it's like, hang on, I feel like I'm interested in unlimited it's like, power. It's like it's like pressing dictator buttons. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah. you're going to be. <laughs> what if, right? So Perron seems to have gone all in. He's like, yes, this is what I want. Uh, yes. This is, this is the thing for me. You had me at unlimited power. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Richter was given a, a laboratory first at um, uh, Kurt Tank's um factory. So okay. Kurt Tank had set up a uh, an aircraft factory um, and he was given a laboratory there, but then there was a fire in 1949 oh. and Richter reckons, man, that was sabotage. Um, I need a place that is more protected and, and, and free from spies. So free from spies. Initially Perron is like, no, I don't know, man. So, so it seems like at this point, Richter went and did a little bit of a tour shopping the world to say, okay, uh, he went to Canada, he went to the US, he went to Europe. And I don't know who he was talking to, but it seems like he was mm. at least pretending to be talking to people. That's so that Perron is like, come back. I'll, okay. give, you, I'll give it all I'll to give you. give you two labs. <laughs> You know, there's there's stories of a strange Austri- Austrian with an Argentine visa in cities around the world demonstrating supposed thermonuclear devices that he's got. And uh, are there? Are there? <laughs> yeah. Well, there are stories. I mean, well, this, when this that- <laughs> reminds me of the time I was in a bar and this uh, this Austrian, calling himself Pedro. Yeah, and had he, had, a- he had a small thermonuclear device with him. <laughs> he said it was for peaceful purposes and it would be unlimited. Unlimited power, man. And he said, do I want it if I bought him a six-pack? But you can just imagine how, again, this is triggering Perron. He's like, oh, I'm so close what? to unlimited power. Someone else? He's shopping it around. Someone else? Oh, yeah, he's totally <laughs> tickling the beanbag of the guy in the perfect way. So, all right, Perron is like, all right, all right, all right, you got me, you got me. He gave his, he gave his top colonel, um, Colonel Gonzalez, so you're going to be the the colonel that's going to help Richter to build this. It's team. always a fucking colonel too. That's the right rank to give someone. But that's, they're, they're just all colonels. There's something about the rank of colonel in, in all places that are predisposed to some kind of overthrow. Yeah. Never trust a colonel. Any yeah. other rank. It's the, it's the middle management. It's close enough yeah. to the top, close enough to the bottom that you can get shit done. And you know they're shuffling around in the background, cooing. <laughs> Never trust your colonel. Never trust the colonel. If I've learned anything from all of world history. <laughs> so Colonel Gonzalez found, all right, let's find you a secret island. And eventually they're found. Um, <laughs> on the edge of the Andes is, it's kind of a resort town, I think. Um, well, there's a lake there called Najul Huepe Lake, and on there is Huemol Island. So edge of, edge of the Andes up there, lake, beautiful lake down here. And I think it actually be, it looks really lovely. It looks really good. I bet it nice. does. And there's a secret lake, Huemol Island. So, not sorry, secret lake, but an island that um, they could keep just secure for this secret plan. Just accessible. All right. Uh, construction work began in July 1949. Yeah. Um, and supposedly 
uh, led to a nationwide shortage of brick and cement. So they're building big. They're what building, the fuck? They're, they're, nationwide? I, I don't know how good the Argentine economy was at producing cements and bricks at the time. All the Argentine uh, builders. How many bricks do you need for that wall? I don't know. A billion? Look, look. Obvious, well, actually, I've got some dimensions of the reactor in a bit. And it's it's quite 900 large. kilometres. It's quite large. By 800 kilometres, by 700 kilometres. Well, here, here we go. So there were multiple reactors um, that they built. All right. So- the first reactor that they built, and it took them about nine months, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and Richter noticed the construction quality wasn't perfect because he noticed not enough bricks that they'd made a twelve meter wide concrete cylinder. So that's the width. I don't have the height, but I think it's it's quite big, uh, with four meter thick walls out of cement and bricks. Damn. Um, but they'd forgotten to drill any any access pathways, so they had to drill through. Uh, you know, because he's going to be pumping in deuterium and hydrogen and stuff like Here's that. Here's your cylinder. <laughs> How do I get into it? You didn't specify that. <laughs> it's closed. You said you wanted so, the cylinder. So they had gone. to drill through four meters of concrete to be able to get into this thing. Oh, um, Christ. And then they realized that that one was cracked. Um, so Wonder they had why. To, so they had to, yeah, exactly. So they had to tear that one, that one down and start it all over again. You need a guy who's good at drilling into tiles. Because they won't crack your stuff. Yeah, there you go. But it was yeah. That's so nuts. so they're building on a pretty large scale. I don't have the height of it. I think it's it's really quite a large thing. Uh, uh, yep. So anyway, Richter's like, all right. While you make me a, a new one of those, make me a baby one as well, um, with a two meter wide reactor. Let's, and and some holes, please. <laughs> with hole this time. This B- time, so I can it. measure Let's stuff and put in. stuff into yeah. it. The experiments, what they were going to do in these cylinders is inject lithium and hydrogen into the cylinder Mm -hmm. and then discharge a spark. So, like, he's got the arc reactor stuff to to set it on fire. Um, The cylinder was supposed to reflect the energy uh, created by these reactions back into the chamber, and that would keep the reaction going. So this is a lot like, you know, actually – Current fusion is based on similar sorts of ideas. You have a container, mm-hmm. you have the explosions, and what you've got to do is try and keep the container, well, keep the explosion contained in a mm. small enough world. Hence the word container. Yeah. He had bricks, but then he also, this is weird. Um, I found some evidence saying this, but it's it's hard to find. Loudspeakers. So – he has sound waves. Sound waves. So inside his um, his concrete and It's some kick-ass container. JBLs with a, like an Alpine subwoofer and, apparently, and boom. Apparently, apparently, loudspeakers were focused at the blast area uh, to try and keep it contained in the middle so that then you could test if the fusion was going And on. it was playing Wagner. Of course. It was <laughs> Wagner. <Fastly> Wagner. <laughs> You know, you know that that would feel so good. Dun, if da, it's done, done, done. Right at the front. Nothing's going anywhere. <laughs> Has to be. <laughs> to overcome that problem, uh, using ion acoustic heating sur- by surrounding an arc with many powerful loudspeakers that focused intense surround sound waves on the arc. So I'm like, oh, oh God. Too bad it's a pre metal day. Damn. Yeah. I, <laughs> I know. This oh. is, so. Diagnostic measurements were provided by taking photographs of the spectrum of, of the explosion yeah. and using Doppler widening to measure the temperature of the resulting reaction. So you can see how hot it's getting. Not a thermometer? No. No, no. no hole for it. And then 16th of February, 1951, Richter claimed, and this I believe went first to the colonel and then up to the uh, generalissimo. Doesn't matter. Uh, Once he had, hit the colonel. He bullshit. had successfully demonstrated fusion. He reran the experiments for members of um, one of the Argentina scientific groups, yeah. later claiming that they had witnessed the world's first thermonuclear reaction. So he claimed on their behalf that's what they saw. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It's totally what they saw. Can we talk to them? No, they're busy. No, it's worth noting there was a technician at the site who said, look, I'm not sure because one of the graphs was the machine was tilted. And, oh. and so so the line that you show going up, that's because the plate was tilted. So, so it might not have been. It might, <laughs> be, it might have been going, um, I'm going to say down. Rector refused to rerun the experiment. He said, no, we've got it. Of we've course. got it. This is done. We're not, we're not, we're not doing it anymore. And in fact. Why mess with perfection? A week later, he said, pull down the reactor um, so that we can build a new one in its place. But we've, we've done is, it. We've done it. Let's totally not demonstrate. You, and that's what you do. That worked really well. <laughs> Trash it. <laughs> Straight away. It worked I never once. want to show this Fuck again. Fuck it off. <laughs> Make it 80 times bigger and better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, they they, they, they were going to build a new giant reactor. Yeah, definitely be, don't do that um, in another spot. Definitely destroy the, the original. <laughs> that just makes sense. That's just science. And how does the dictator go? Yes. Well, 24th of March, one per on. And this is the conference I said. It's weirdly like 24th of March, mm. um, 1951. He held a press conference and he says, 
On February 16th, 1951, so, you know, a week and a half earlier, in the atomic energy pilot plant on Huemul Island, thermonuclear experiments were carried out under conditions of control on a technical scale. Argentina has, has successfully produced the controlled liberation of atomic energy, not through uranium f- fuel, but rather through the simplest and lightest of all elements, hydrogen. It would be transcendental for the future of life and would bring a greatness which today we cannot imagine. Yes. So he, he's, he's like- most, most of that's not untrue. If, if, if. Yeah, most uh, of that. You know, what, what Perron is saying is entirely true if- So like if time travel worked right- <laughs> Well, look, if Richter, if Richter had been honest yeah. about this, then, yeah. then, you know- All good. He was, right? So it went around the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah this is the point where Perron said- um, energy would be bought and I, I don't understand this bit. He said that energy would be uh, solved in Argentina or around the world. Uh, they'd build nuclear power plants across the country, fusion power plants across the country. Energy would be bought and sold in containers the size of a milk bottle. I'm not sure how that works. I don't think he was either. <laughs> I, I think I think when he said like he understood fusion, I don't I, think I wanna, he understood I wanna, fusion. I want how much do I want? A liter of energy? <laughs> Kind of liter of energy, but also energy is bought and sold in containers like milk bottles. It's called you know petrol fuel. You know we we do that, and yeah, but I think what he's saying is is maybe everyone's going to have like a, a deuterium reactor and, and you just buy a, a canister the of deuterium. Think Back to the Future when you just put the banana skins in. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, or something like that. It's weird. Fusion um, nine thousand. The next day, Richter went and had a, um, a press conference as well. Mm. Uh, was spoke heaps and heaps. It was called the ten thousand word interview. So it went for Fuck, a long that's time. long. Uh, yeah, I know. That was only his words. <laughs> yeah. Um, and basically didn't give any details on the experiment. No. That said, that no. said uh, what the fuel was. Um, Hydrogen. He used the Doppler effect to measure speeds of 3,300 kilometers a second of the, of the gas in the um, – Okay. And the fuel was either lithium hydrodide or deuterium. And he said, look, it's small scale, but he said this is, this is it. This is fusion. And on the 7th of April, um, Perron gave Richter the gold Peronista Party Medal, which is the, Hell best, yeah. the best medal you can I get. I know, Peronista. That sounds like a delicious drink. So headlines went around the world. So New York Times ran a piece. Um, we get places all over the world saying, okay, fusion's been achieved, but it's in a weird secret laboratory down in Argentina. In a country you wouldn't expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Argentina yeah. was not exactly world leader in science at the time. Not a technical powerhouse? Um. So, so there's a discussion of the Bulletin of Amer- Atomic Scientists mm. um, not long after. And they said, look, there's not a lot of details here. We, ne- we need more details. American physicists were universally dismissive. Uh, so there's, there's people like George Gamow who said it seemed to be 95% pure propaganda, four and three quarters percent thermonuclear reactions on a very small scale. So they're like, maybe oh, something's yeah. going on here. So he's giving away a lot and of And the room. remaining quarter percent, probably something better. So it's like, okay, there, there, there is a chance that something weird's going here. 0.25%. Edward Lawrence, there is a tendency to laugh it off as being a lot of hot air or something. Well, it may be, but we don't know all and we should make every effort to find out. Edward Teller said, reading one line, one has to think he's a genius. Reading the next line, one think, realizes he's crazy. <clears throat> and like in a 10,000 word interview, if the first line's good and the rest aren't, the weight of evidence <sighs> is pretty strong in one direction. Uh, it's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, look. Uh, lack of details. The bottom line for me is it's lack of details. Therefore, totally. what you say is and it's not yet. It's again not published. Like like yeah. journals exist at this time. Absolutely. Yeah. And having the pre- dictator president coming out and saying we've got it, oh, that, got that it. is not the same as peer review. It's really well, it's not. Not even the same as sharing a list of the things you did at all, even without peer review. Mm. Here's exactly how he did it. Here's one. That perhaps the most biting criticism came from Richter's old boss, oh. uh, Manfred von Arden, um, who was the German uh, guy that he was working with during the war, yeah. potentially working on German fusion. Um, he went to the Soviet pl- uh, plan to build the atomic bomb. Mm. People should ignore Richter's claims, noting that he'd worked with Richter during the war and said he confused fantasy with reality. So weird, weird, weirdly, I was reading about that um, von Arden guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, he worked, you know, he helped build the Soviet bomb. He was working on um, the German nuclear program, did a lot, lot of electro chemical stuff, weird things like that. And then the next line said he's considered um, one of the key inventors of the television. I'm like, is he? What the hell? What the hell? By who? Oh, Peron. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing. My boss, he, he helped invent television. So we can talk about this discovery <laughs> on the Maybe TV. That's it. That's yeah. it. <laughs> it's all coming together, boss. 
Fucking clowns. <laughs> so Argentine physicists were were pretty critical of the announcement, and and Peron had a really hostile relationship with all of the, the scientific science community. Imagine, imagine a imagine. brutal dictator um, having a hostile, hostile yeah. relationship with people who yeah. think and learn and prove shit. <laughs> So Colonel Gonzalez um, was also growing pretty frustrated with Richter. I don't know what about, um, but by February 1952, so this is nine months later, yeah. said, uh, okay, either Richter goes or he did. And so Perron fired Gonzalez. Of course he did. Because um, where's he going to get another colonel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and replaced him with a Navy captain, uh, Pedro Irolaguitio. Colonel equivalent. Um, he, he began to protest as well. And at that point, Peron's like, all right, you're losing all of your aids. What's going on here? Something about colonels. I'm <laughs> telling you, a Navy captain's a colonel. He's like, we got to do an investigation. And, yeah. and this is this is the thing. I love this. Peron put together a team consisting of the Navy officer, Iralogitia, a priest, yeah. two engineers, and one physicist. I've heard this joke. To go, to go and check out this reactor and see what's going on. I don't know why the priest is going. You need spiritual guidance. You need morality. The team went down there in uh, for a series of visits between the uh, in September 1952, yeah. and they sent their report to uh, Peron, and in particular the physicist. I don't know what the priest said that nothing nuclear is taking place. Like it's like he's putting stuff into the container and it's 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 setting on fire, but we're not getting any nuclear fusion. Which is great. Thank you for telling me that, physicist. Now I want to hear what the priest says. This is the work of the devil. Excuse me, padre. What's your impression of the science? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's beautiful. He's doing God's work. Yeah, thanks for your input. So the, the physicist is like, no way. Nothing is going on here. And they reported this to Peron. And Peron is like, all right, this is no good. Peron sent in the military, took over the secret laboratory site, and Richter was put under house arrest in Buenos Aires. Between 1952 and 1955, Richter was effectively under house arrest in Buenos Aires, uh, and and Peron said, "I'm happy to facilitate any travel you might want to make, but if you've got to ask the dictator yourself if you can travel, I think that's uh, you're under house arrest. But if you want to go somewhere, sure. And by sure, I mean no. Well, I mean sure, but uh, no. there are there are hidden strings attached. I'm not telling you what the strings are, but and by strings, I mean no." <laughs> I don't want to ask a dictator anything. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, Not for to. anything. <laughs> like, how good are you? That's awesome. But like, could I have? And as soon as you start there, you're like, ah, oh, damn it. It's gonna cost you. Yeah, it's gonna cost you. But uh, I mean, point of sorrow is I've you know been through there in a fleeing trip. I'm and, sure. And I'm it sure. Looks great. Of in, all places to be under house arrest, it's you it know. looks great in 2023. Uh, for the next three years, he's under house arrest, and then uh, in September 1955. Um, Peron was deposed and the new government came in and said, fucking let's get this Richter guy. Let's put him under a proper arrest. He was accused of fraud. fraud. Proper uh, he spent time in jail. Yeah. Um, and it's estimated that um, the project probably cost something like uh, half a billion of today dollars, US mm. dollars. Like like they spent a lot in building these reactors um, in this secret island. Um, and while in prison he invented the victimless crime <sighs> and the perfect legal system. He just doesn't have the working of the details. <laughs> He Richter stayed in Argentina for a while, but um, the whole fusion project that he'd been working on was defunct. Like the, yep. the military closed it down. He wasn't getting anywhere near any science anymore. He travelled around the world uh, for a while. He was in Libya for a while, and then he eventually lived out the rest of his life in Argentina until he was 1990. Fuck Argentina. I'm going to Libya. I know. I want a more relaxed environment where I can get <laughs> shit done and no one's going to get in the way. Like, oh. Well, there was a colonel that went to the top. Wasn't there? Yeah, he was, you know. <laughs> Never trust a colonel. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay. All the scientists said, no, no fusion mm. happened here. This is, this is. You're going to tell is, me it did. This is, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. It doesn't look like any fusion actually happened. Yeah, you're um, hedging. You, you're not, you're not, not saying it. It did lead directly to action. In, in action, two really interesting ways. Pons and Fleischmann. There you go. That's no, both. no, not Pons and Fleischmann. So the press in the US, they discounted Richter's work and said, look, it's probably not true, but the government started funding two projects straight away afterwards. They're like, okay, put uh, put some money into fusion. So that Project Sherwood and Project Matterhorn, where they're investigating possible fusion reactors. Both run by MK Ultra, so, you know. I, I don't know. I don't know. But, they're but, but they were like, sensor. okay, I even if this isn't true, then uh, find it's out. worth looking at. Yeah, I agree. But also, here's the one. The most direct outcome of the announcement uh, was its effect on Lyman Spitzer, an astrophysicist at, Spit at Princeton. So Lyman Spitzer was about to leave for a ski, ski trip to Aspen, 
And his father called and said, hey, did you see the, the article in the New York Times about these Argentinians that have, um, that have got nuclear fusion? Now, Spitzer, he read the article and he said, like, nah, they, 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 that's no. not going to work. They can't no. do that. From, from what I can see, yeah, yeah. can't happen. Yeah. But he did consider, hang on, you've got hot plasma in this thing and you're using these loudspeakers to control things. Uh. And he's like, well, actually what we do need is some sort of system to control the explosion. You got to get it way hotter. You got to get it up to like yeah. ten to hundred million degrees Celsius. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? We could use a magnetic bottle. We could use this is his 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 explanation. It's called a, it's called a stellarator. Stellarator. So what this is is a system of magnets that will control an explosion and keep it going round in a in a not a circle in a figure eight when he initially oh, thought it. The symbol um, of infinity. Uh, yeah, but um, Why? but basically we use that in. Tokamak reactors yeah. um, in nuclear fu fusion projects now to control the explosion and keep it going down. So Spitzer invented within a year, year and a half, two years later, um, invented the Stellarator as the magnetic bottle Damn. that would be able to control a fusion reactor. And although it seems like Richter may have been a con artist, may have been a fraud, he did seem to have that. some good ideas here and he inspired directly to the magnetic bottle that came out. It, do, it makes immediate sense, though, that, like, think about that. How do we have an object? How can we contain this thing without the thing being touched like a normal well, physical it's, it's object? It's like the sun. It's yeah. like the sun. And so. Magnets. And we all know at the time. Or loudspeakers. Magnets. Loudspeakers and heavy metal. It's interesting to me. I was, um, I was reading about the Pons and Fleischmann cold fusion case. Mm. And, um, and there was an interesting point that I read by a friend of ours, Bruce Lewinstein. And he was saying, you know, Scientists hope that the cold fusion story is unique. Like that this yeah, is yeah, yeah, this yeah. is weird and different and you know, we fucked up. But, but it never happened again. But Lew Lewinstein yeah. is arguing, I believe the opposite is true. Virtually nothing about cold fusion is new or different. Instead, the cold fusion saga simply illustrates what we already know about science about how in researchers interact with the media, with politicians, with the patent system, with each other, and with nature. We can use the history of cold fusion as a window through which to view modern science. Yep. You know what? I think the same thing applies with the Hermel project as well. That uh, Ronald Richter, he got the ear of a dictator. He used that to build something weird and yep. weird on an island. And it's it probably something that didn't people work. Want. It's something that people want. Yeah. And it came close to yeah. really giving us something really quite Yeah. Good. If people want it enough, we're all good at that. Like, I really want this to be true. So maybe it is. Mm -mm. It sounds science. He's going to bash things. He's got big you stuff. Know, you know what? I, I think it's also. There's something that's said about dictators and how credulous they must be. Yeah. Like I yeah. get, I get, you know, they're, they're willing to murder everyone. So they're yeah. hyper paranoid all the time about yeah. personal threats to safety. But hearing from a scientist, hey, I've got, I can get you unlimited power. Jesus. Can I have, I know, half a billion and an <laughs> island. I want an island. I need an island. I don't feel safe without one. But I, I, I suppose they are. If you just surround yourself with yes men or yes folk, of course, you're going to go nuts which, because you don't know what's real anymore. Which is why Putin now has a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Of course he fucking does. <laughs> and God knows what else. And that's why, what is it, Twitter's become X because that would be better than the thing that everyone's already using a lot. Let's fuck with it instead. I mean, you, but you get, you get that yes bubble. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I mean, exactly. you would go mad. If people exactly. would, were, were afraid to tell you anything you thought of was not possible or wrong, yep. you're going to go nuts. Totally, totally. That's why I'm kept safe because, you know. Everyone's always telling you you're wrong. I know. <laughs> and I never have any ideas because I don't want to risk it. So between us, never going to be dictators. Maybe a cult uh... leader. Cult leader. We'll see you next week, listener. Join the cult. <laughs>